Hi friends, happy Friday. Friends of France Friday in the house. How are you doing? How about me? I'm doing single. Thank you for asking. Valentine's Day is around the quarter and I could not be more bitter. <laughs> I'm joking. But honestly though, I'm curious to know what you're all getting your boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse or partner or whatever you call your special someone this upcoming day of hearts. All you blessed people. <laughs> are there roses involved or chocolates or a good dinner? Do you know the famous saying, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach? Well, for our podcast episode today, we'll take quite a spin on that saying. Instead of the heart, because mine is cold and lonely, <laughs> we'll instead be talking about the brain. The way to a man's brain is through his stomach. Say what? As you know, this is a science and medicine podcast. So we're keeping it evidence-based and research-backed here. The heart plays the brain. The brain and the stomach in unison connection? You got that right. If you're on social media, especially TikTok, for sure you have heard these two terms by now. Probiotics and the gut microbiome, or gut microbiota. These pushed for products and concepts of an ecosystem of bacteria and microorganisms in our stomach, or gut, have been blooming <laughs> online in recent years. And probiotics, which are said to support this environment, in turn of health benefits, like improved nutrient absorption, skin inflammation, and even mental acuity, have been lauded by influencers and experts alike. This is said to be due to our enteric nervous system, the largest and most complex unit of the peripheral nervous system. Yes, a little brain in our gut, that facilitates the many functions of our gastrointestinal tract. Now, where does our actual brain come into play? The gut-brain axis, or GBA. In recent years of research and even simple discourse online, there has been talks of the communication between our gut's enteric nervous system and our central nervous system found in our head, the brain. The gut-brain axis is a bi-directional communication between these two nervous systems. Because the gut can influence the brain, and the brain can influence the gut, it is believed that what and how we eat can influence our behavior and emotions. Likewise, some chaos in our brain, like times of stress and overwhelming emotions, can affect our gut microbiome and the functions of our stomach, like its emptying times, mucosal immune response, acid secretion, and so forth. But how actually true is all of this? Does our gut health, and in turn our diets, affect the way our brains develop or how we behave? What does the sciences of the nervous system actually say? I am so honored to be joined today by an expert to talk all about this. We are joined today by behavioral neuroscientist, toxicologist, neuropharmacologist, and international fashion model, Dr. Aya Osman. She received her bachelor's in biomedical sciences with honors from the University of London, master's in toxicology focusing on the role of adenosine and glutamate receptors in cocaine addiction from the University of Surrey, where she also received her PhD in toxicology and neuropharmacology, where she investigated the development of brain opioid and oxytocin receptor systems in response to early life dietary manipulation. She then worked as a toxicologist at the Center for Radiation, Chemical, and Environmental Hazards for the governmental body Public Health England. Dr. Osmond completed her postdoctoral research fellowship at the Friedman Brain Institute in the Seaver Autism Center for Research and Treatment at Aiken School of Medicine at Mount Sinai here in New York City, where she now serves as an assistant professor, focusing on the role of gut microbiome changes in brain development and the pathophysiology of neuropsychiatric disorders. I mean, you have the perfect person to talk all about this. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You're in for a wild ride today. I have a gut feeling. <laughs> have a good day. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Of course. Are you in New York City as well? <laughs> yes, I am. Are you? Yes. I'm so happy that the sun is setting later and later into the day and we're having more sunlight. Where in New York are you? I'm in Brooklyn right now. How about you? Happen, but Brooklyn is where my heart lives. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, again, thank you so much for being with me tonight. You know, we've been planning this for quite a while now, and today is the perfect day for us to finally have this. We have so many things to talk about, about science and also other things. If you could just first please introduce yourself to everybody. Yes, thank you for having me again. You know, you've had some wonderful guests on your platform, so I'm honored to be one of them. 
My name is Aya Osman and I'm a uh, researcher, a neuroscientist in uh, New York and I'll, we'll get into all of our research and stuff. <laughs> Originally I'm from the UK but Originally, before that, <laughs> my parents are from South Africa. And um, as many of you might know or have heard in the news at the moment, you know, Sudan's undergoing a terrible time at the moment with fighting between two army leaders. So they used to be part of the same mm -hmm. army and amongst each other for rule over the land. But, you know, it's kind of like the war has now reached the capital Khartoum and it's kind of like seeing like LA or, or London or New York, you know, it's just so to see somewhere that's so familiar and usually bustling now kind of scattered with dead bodies and rockets and whatnot yep just wanted to say if everyone is uh listening you know just like uh follow keep eyes on the matter if there's any links for donations and things like that yeah definitely and thank you for sharing that it's definitely such a pressing issue i know that the whole conflict started like in april 15 and since then it's like so many lives have been lost i know hospital and health centers have been seized and i think fear for biological warfare because of a lab was seized right and just so many heartbreaking things going on and super agree with raising awareness so thank you so much for sharing that something around like 400 people have lost their lives currently and over 3,000 injured so yeah thank you for highlighting those facts i mean as a side turn to that i think what went on today especially I, i think it's a very close to what you have been doing in the past too i mean i i know that you're doing your science now but i know you also have got into toxicology as well can you just give us a timeline and this journey of how you reach to where you are now doing all this amazing research <laughs> I have to say, you've definitely done your homework. You were uh, MSc in toxicology. I'll start this by saying that I'm definitely one of those people that didn't have like a blueprint in mind. I honestly just followed my instincts and what I enjoyed and what I felt I was good at. So my journey into science really began from high school. Well, you know, it began before that in that my parents, my mother's side of the family were, you know, multiple PhD holders, philosophers, mm -hmm. and none of them really followed that track in the West. And so I've always been around people who are like big thinkers and philosophical thinkers. And then from my dad's side of the family, he's a lawyer, so he's very much evidence-based. Yeah. And so I ended up on the track. And so from high school, just noticed I had a talent for science and biology in particular. And then in the UK, you kind of finish high school, then you have A-levels. And for A-levels, I chose uh, free biology, you know, basic science to, um And then when it got to university, which is what I think the equivalent of college here, I chose to do biomedical science because that was more of a broad entry into, I was going to medicine and, you know, there's always pressure from family to go down that route. So at first, that's really why I did biomedical science, mm -hmm. thinking I'd go that route. But then really during the biomedical science degrees, when I got introduced to pharmacology and neuroscience and toxicology, my introduction to neuroscience was through like, the pharmacology and toxicology lens. Mm -hmm. So that's drugs and, you know, how your body metabolizes. How, how they act in the system. And so I finished my biomedical science degree and realized I, I loved learning and loved studying and wanted to continue down the pharmacology and toxicology route. But I didn't do that straight away. I actually worked like in retail for a while. I was like a manager for Abercrombie mm -hmm. for a while. And, then oh. back and, that, and that was a way of like also saving money yeah. towards my master's. Yeah. So then I started my master's in toxicology. And so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, people may be watching us be like, what is toxicology? What is this all about? You know, the root word in there is toxic. But as a toxicologist yourself, what is the premise behind this whole field? So toxicology is really the interaction between hazardous or injurious substances and living organisms, right? So that covers anything from humans to trees and the environment. And so toxicology has several branches. It's actually quite a broad discipline because, yeah, toxins or hazardous substances can interact with so much. And so it really covers, you know, cellular and molecular biology, immunology, pharmacology, mm -hmm. how drugs are broken mm -hmm. down, pathology. And so you have toxicologists that specialize in each of those principles. And so during my master's, we covered all of that. But then for my master's research project, mm -hmm. I focused on the pharmacology aspect and drugs mm -hmm. and how I metabolize drugs. And, and I then got into drugs of abuse and how mm -hmm. they are toxins to the brain, if you, you know, cocaine these are toxins right so that's how I got into drug addiction through the toxicology route but before I went on to do my PhD which delved deeper into all of that 
there was an branch of toxicology, which is more like the environmental public health aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So after my master's, again, I told you I didn't have this direct trajectory. After I finished my master's, I actually worked for about two and a half years for Public Health England as a desk-based toxicologist. So what your job there really is all about, you know, you're dealing with governmental bodies like the environmental agency. I mean, for example, say there's a, a leak somewhere, a chemical leak, you'd get all that information and you'd have to do an assessment of what levels are safe from this leak, who needs to be evacuated, how much level of, you know, is safe for people around that area to be exposed to. So it was mainly assessing hazards that came into public health and providing information in terms of the toxic dose and how to treat, but it wasn't wet-based, yeah. you know, desk. Yeah, I mean, it's super interesting. I mean, this this whole field and this whole discipline. And I think it's very relevant to our time now. I think as people in the world are spending more time on social media, are spending more time on the internet, and are landing on Google searches or news that's set out in social media, right? And I think a word that's commonly seen now online is the word toxic, right? You see in skincare, like, oh, this is a toxic chemical found in sunscreens. Oh, this is toxic. Don't choose it. It's not natural. It's not this or that. And to some extent, it may seem like the word toxic and toxicity is overused or not. And that's what I want to ask you as the expert of the field. To you, what is the exact meaning or what causes something to be toxic? Is it the substance itself or is the dose the poison? Exactly. Hit the nail on the head there. So the, the concept of toxicology was actually born by this Renaissance physician called Purcell's. I think he was... Mm. And his real name, he gave himself that name. And he was really the first one to come out and say the toxin is in the dose. Anything and everything from the nutrients that are good for us to water to cocaine, all of them are safe up until a certain dose, right? Mm -hmm. And beyond them, they become hazardous in that they have off-target mm -hmm. negative effects. And so it was from this, the dose is what makes the poison that the modern concept of a threshold, you know, no adverse effect level, which is a threshold that, you know, everything that's tested from vaccines mm -hmm. to everyday shower yeah. gels and deodorants all undergo toxic testing. And they're all those at which they are safe, essentially. Yeah. So Anyone? It's a, yeah. It is definitely overused yeah. without understanding that even drinking water can be yeah. toxic. Definitely. I for sure that the term is overused. But I really wanted to also delve into one of your researches, which is very interesting, is about cocaine addiction, right? I, I know you're talking about like adenosine and glutamate receptors. I, I guess for the layperson, what have you seen as a toxicologist and who has studied, you know, this field of cocaine addiction and illicit drug addiction? What do they really do to the brain? I think it's become a culture now as well, right? In our music festivals and People take it recreationally now as well. What does science say about these substances? You know, drugs are wonderful things mm -hmm. if we didn't get it right. So the main issue with drugs is addiction because drugs can actually have great benefits from, you know, reducing pain mm -hmm. to alleviate symptoms of depression and so on. And it, the fact that they cause addiction, that was what makes them harmful. And how they do that is all drugs of a use essentially increase the levels of dopamine, the neurotransmitter dopamine, in the reward circuit. So for anything to be classified as potentially abusive or a drug of abuse, it has to act on the dopamine system reward circuitry. So that's really the main mechanism of well, each drug has its own mechanism mm -hmm. of action. Pain and methamphetamine, you know, they increase hyperactivity or make people active, or as opioids and cannabinoids or cannabis, you know, reduce activity. So all drugs of abuse have their own mechanism of action, but they all converge into this one thing, which is they increase dopamine and they really, they result in addiction. And so how they result in addiction is the main study that everyone's focused on, because if you can cure that, that's, that's yeah. wonderful. And so because the reward circuitry is parts of the reward circuitry are so in, like they're part of the oldest parts of our brain, they yeah. evolved and we needed them them because we need our brain to tell us when something is good for us so if you eat something that tastes good you're going to want to feel rewards so that you keep eating so you mm -hmm. can same with socializing mm -hmm. same with sex, same with all these rewarding things they all increase mm -hmm. dopamine in the brain 
but none of them do them to the extent that drugs of abuse do. And so drugs of abuse cause dopamine at such high levels, that's how they affect the brain. And so what happens over time is, you know, drug addiction is kind of defined by the cycle of, first of all, intoxication the first time you take it. Then you start to binge because it felt good. You keep doing it. Then you try to stop and you get withdrawal and then you get preoccupation and then you relapse. And so the cycle over and over again. And this all comes from this elevated level of dopamine. And then when, when that isn't there anymore, when you stop taking the drug, because the dopamine levels are so low now, the brain's yeah. trying to like adjust different parts of your brain get recruited, like the amygdala, which starts to make you feel anxious and afraid once you've stopped taking the drug. The cortex, which is the front part of your brain and kind of controls socializing and decisions, mm -hmm. making decisions, that also gets kind of looped into the addiction cycle. So when you stop taking the drug, even your prefrontal cortex is now compromised. And so that's really where you start seeing people get withdrawn because they're not taking the drug anymore or they're preoccupied with getting the drug and they're socially withdrawn. So all in all, in answer to your question, drugs affect our brain or because of this increase in dopamine that they cause and then the downstream consequences of that sustained high level. Ever since I was a child, my inner arms and neck would always suffer from itchiness and irritation whenever I would sweat. It can become so debilitating, forcing myself not to scratch my skin and end up with wounds from prickly heat, especially at night. Thankfully, I have found relief through By Dr. Mom's Soothing Beta Cream and Soothing Bad Treatment, which uses barley-derived beta-glucan technology to help alleviate eczema, bug bites, and dry, itchy, irritated skin. Beta-glucan is a fiber shown in scientific studies to improve skin hydration and healing, and by Dr. Mom's products extract it with a technique that uses air technology, requiring no chemicals or solvents. Created by family physician Dr. Stephanie Liu with the help of an allergist and immunologist, you can now allow your skin to breathe and heal naturally. Using the code CHRISTIAN10, that's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-1-0, you can get 10% off your first order on buydrmom.com. As a healthcare worker, my identity can become so boxed within the pressures and expectations of my profession that sometimes I forget who I really am outside the hospital walls. This is why I find so much power and liberation in self-expression through fashion and accessories, and Lupin seeks to do the same. Encouraging self-confidence and creating a safe space to be yourself, Lupin seeks to share with the world simple and impactful jewelry pieces that can bring confidence effortlessly. Meaning what goes around comes around, the brand, comprised of third-generation jewelers, holds a mission to brighten the community by promoting positivity and a growth mindset. Lupin's clean designs are handcrafted in South Korea using 925 sterling silver and can go with almost any outfit on anyone. In fact, I wear my pieces on and off shift. With the code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, you can get 15% off your first order on lupin.com. Let's bring more luster into the world, together with Lupin. I remember coming home every day from elementary school and smelling the newly steamed jasmine rice in the cooker that my grandmother made just in time for dinner. It reminded me of my first few years living on the farm back home in Asia, sniffing the rice while overlooking the fields. Founded in 2020, Bison Candle Co. hand pours nostalgic and iconic scented soy wax candles inspired by the Asian scents flavors, and traditions that founder Brandon Leung grew up with in his first-generation Chinese-American household. Brandon's mission with Baisan is to create authentic Asian aromas while rediscovering his love of his Chinese culture and heritage. The candles and home fragrances celebrate aromatic Eastern flavors and aromas one would typically find in an Asian kitchen or pantry, like Vietnamese coffee, steamed white rice, and white peach. Enjoy traditional scents alongside some modern spin-off blends and be taken back into the beauty of the motherland with the code Bison Franz, that's B-A-I-S-U-N-F-R-A-N-Z for 15% off your first order at bisoncandleco.com. whole addiction mechanism is such an intricate topic right i know that even if like someone who is addicted to an illicit substance already if they try in a different environment or location right they, they will need higher to get the high that they did before and it's just so interesting how the brain works in all of this and addiction is just one topic when it comes to the brain i mean 
I'm so scared of neuroscience because it's just so much. It's so much information and you decided to be an expert in it, you know. Well, it's exhausting. Every, you feel like you don't know anything. Um, but yeah, what, I, I just wanted to kind of touch on what you said on there that, yeah, when you take a drug in a specific setting, your brain learns to associate that setting with the drug. Mm-hmm. And so if you ever stop taking a drug, you know, after a while and you come back to the setting, you're more likely to to relapse. So that's actually called conditioning. And we use that in the lab when we're testing addiction in mice because how the mouse is addicted or not, it's not like a human, you can't yeah. ask. So we do something called conditioned place preference where it gets a chamber with two different rooms that look and feel different to the mouse. And in one chamber, we give it an injection of just saline. And so now it's this room with feeling not high. And then in a different room for like days, depending on what drug it is, you give it an injection of, of your drug of choice. And you do that over time until the animal learns to condition that room with the and then on the final day of the test, you put your mouse like kind of in the middle and you let it choose. And if it chooses the room that you used to get the drug in, then you know it's addicted. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. You know, actually, a, a few episodes ago, I, uh, I have a live stream with a neurosurgeon. And I was like, what is the most interesting thing that you've seen so far in your, like, um, I think, four decades of experience of being a neurosurgeon? And she was like, honestly, she said, there's something new every day that I find out about the brain. And it just reminded me of what you just said, where it's like, she even said, I think I'm going to get neurotic during neurology. <laughs> honestly, all jokes aside, like, I know people who've actually left neuroscience because they found it so difficult studying something that, first of all, is so difficult and yeah. endless, but also so applicable to everyday life. So you start overanalyzing everything, or if you're conditioned and you're studying that condition, forget it. Like you're definitely going to then go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But then we'll talk about why I also do everything else on the side yeah. to kind of balance. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, like like I mentioned about the neurosurgeons, very mechanical, very physical, very surgical. And then we have the whole field of neuroscience. When I think of neuroscience, all that's coming up in my mind is just like neurons sending electrical signals to each other, you know, all the action potentials and just down the line. As the expert, you are the expert here. What is the premise of neuroscience? And I know specifically with the behavioral neuroscience, what differentiates the the two? Neuroscience, like simply put, is the study of of the nervous system, right? Um, And so that's both the brain and the periphery because you have Mm -hmm. nerves. And so the main focus of neuroscience is the brain. And like you said, neurons, the science of neurons, we have over eight to six billion neurons in your brain. So there's a lot to study there. So people, you know, the biology of the neurons, some people study the circuits. So then when you're talking about the brain, there's yeah. different, that's more people. We call those more systems neuroscience because they're looking at, at it as, as a whole. What I'm called is a behavioral neuroscientist because I look at how the science of those neurons or how those neurons fire and how they work, how that drives behavior, right? And so I try to map specific circuits in the brain that drive anxiety or depression or parts of addiction. I don't really do much circuitry. I'm trying to get more into circuitry <laughs> for biology. So how the neuron itself fires or how the biology of that neuron um, contributes to a behavior. And, you know, a lot of your research also talks about this thing that I've been hearing all around. And my friends have also told me about it, too, that they were like, you know, I've been, since I posted our, our, our um, announcement for a lot, they're like, and they're not in the science fields at all. They said, we've been seeing this term gut-brain access all throughout. And they're like, what? I said, what is the connection between our brain and our stomach? And I'm like, well, you have to wait for the expert to tell us, right? So... You know, this has been going all around. And I think it has also become a trampoline for a lot of wellness products as well, right? And a, a lot of the wellness things that we see online. What is this term coming about called the gut-brain access? What is the connection between our brain and the stomach? That's another one that I think is thrown about way too much. Uh, it's too soon. So yeah. A gut-brain access research that I can tell you, even within the scientific community, like, how difficult it is to try and convince people that there is a connection between the gut and the brain. People will say to you, there's like an ocean between the gut and the brain. How are you communicating? So, but that's not to say that there isn't a connection. A lot of evidence over 
10 years of evidence now mounting to show that there is this connection. It's just that with anything this new, uh, neuroscience in itself is also quite a new field. Mm -hmm. You what is carefully and it's very early days. And so, you know, I'd be careful with any company or any probiotic or ever saying that it has, you know, effects on the brain. It might, there are definitely some of my research is showing alterations to the gut can mm -hmm. definitely brain and affect behavior, but the mechanisms and pinning down exactly what you can target to have that effect is not quite there yet. So the gut and the brain, the gut, which is called the gut brain axis, is this bi-directional communication, mm -hmm. just back and forth. The brain communicates with the gut and the gut communicates with the brain. And we know that there are several routes of communication. You know, just this morning, I was at a lecture about how our body communicates with our brain that it's full or that it's hungry. Even things like thermoregulation, cold mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's interaction. So there's different routes. And some people study the nervous, the nervous system and that connects it. So there's a specific nerve called the vagus nerve, mm -hmm. group from the gut to the brain. But this vagus nerve, also innovates so many other organs. It has so many jobs other than just the gut brain axis. But people are really refining the vagus nerve now and looking at specific parents and you know specific parts of the uh, vagus nerve that innovate the gut and kind of assessing which ones of those are the signal. So that's one way that they can communicate through the nervous system. Then you have through hormones. Then you have the immune system as well. So what I focus on, and it is touching on the, on the immune system more and more now, and I'm just like, you know, neuroscience is enough. I really don't know. <laughs> you have quite a few aspects of my research that look into So the immune system is another way that they can communicate, but also metabolize. So your gut, that, the reason you have bacteria in your gut is they help you metabolize and break down the foods that you eat and they help you produce nutrients and components that you can't produce on yourself otherwise so a lot of these metabolites that are released by gut bacteria can enter circulation and into the brain and so that's another route of communication between the gut brain axis as you're talking about the bacteria you know what comes to mind is the term that we've also been seeing right the gut microbiome you know <laughs> that we've been seeing everywhere that said given that it is a bidirectional relationship between the gut and the brain does this mean that the brain or the gut in itself, in, the, in, the, in the one term, does it give influence on the foods or the drinks that we should consume to maintain this healthy relationship? So I realized I jumped into the gut microbiome because like I'm so used to yeah. anyone saying that, oh, they mean the gut microbiome, yeah. but of course, it's more than just that. So, yeah, yeah the um, or the gut microbiome refers to the trillions of microorganisms that live in your gut. And those are bacteria, but also you have mm -hmm. virus and fungi, all sorts in there. And so a lot of my research has been the development of the gut microbiome. So all of my research has been like early life yeah. and also the gut. So when you're born, there's, it's still kind of debated whether there's um, a microbiome before birth. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of most likely isn't. Yeah. But when you're born, the bacteria from your mother's vaginal canal and else that's wonderful that happens during <laughs> sets the imprint of your microbiome or imprints your first exposure to bacteria mm -hmm. and over the first five years your microbiome is kind of fluctuating and then it begins to stabilize from five years it takes on like an adult composition and after that it's actually very difficult to change your microbiome drastically mm -hmm. so you know unless it's like something through sustained diet yes diet is definitely one of the factors that influences the microbiome, what you eat, but also several other factors in early life, um, such as how one was it vaginal, was it cesarean? Um, mm. And then you were weaned. A lot of my research was around when you should wean or shouldn't wean a, a mammal, mm -hmm. because that huge dietary switch from milk to solids. And so mm. that will affect the microbiome. So yes, what you eat will affect your microbiome. And it's probably the best way to influence your microbiome for good or for bad. Yeah, and speaking of influence, I mean, people are definitely influenced online. I think this new science, uh, or rather, this new thinking is like very exploited, right? By a lot of companies and a lot of, oh, if you do this detox cleanse, it will change your flora in your stomach and you'll become healthier and all that. <laughs> what can you say about all of those online tactics when it comes to the <laughs> microbiome sphere? You know, 
all I'm going to say is in the lab, when I want to change my animal's microbiome, I have to do some seriously drastic things, like give them a, a really like long or strong dose of antibiotics for like 10 days to knock down all their gut <laughs> or I have to, like generate them germ free. So it takes a lot to influence your microbiome. But that's not to say that there are certain things that you can do and can eat that do influence your microbiome for the better. So in general, a healthy microbiome is defined by diversity. So, you know, think of it like uh, race, as many, you know, Italian, Spanish, yeah. whatever people that you The more diverse, the better. And that's because you'll have so many different functional groups doing their thing and producing what they need to uh, produce. So diversity of your microbiome and then the ratio of these two major bacterial phyla in there is the two other important marker and so eating things like focusing on eating things like fiber i know you're doing this but it's true because it helps with gut motility and everything else changes the conditions within the gut and a lot of gut bacteria use it as like a substrate the best advice i've heard from somebody called john crian who's a big name in the field is when you eat if you try and make sure your plate looks like a rainbow basically as colorful as possible and different varieties as possible, your microbiome will be fine. I love that. Um, <laughs> and he's talking about fiber or the diversity of the, the, the diet they're proposing. Yeah, those are things that you can listen out to and take on board. I think this also ties a lot into the research that you do at Mount Sinai, right? I mean, I read parts of it where you talk about the Shangri-La gene and the influence of the gut microbiome potentially on, I think, the autism spectrum, right? Can you talk more about your research on that? Yeah, as if addiction wasn't enough, <laughs> I decided to. <laughs> I am trying to find a way to kind of like merge the two. But autism, how I got into that was from my PhD project, looking at diet in early life and how diet can affect your microbiome in early life and how if your microbiome is altered in early life, your brain is then altered. And so because your brain regulates mood and behavior, mm -hmm. basically, what you eat can affect your mood, essentially, was my PhD work, or it can affect behavior, so things in early life. And so because autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, it has a developmental origin. So it something happens during the development of the brain that results in phenotypes of autism. And I do have to be very careful how I speak here because it's really great, but there's, you know, there's a lobby or people who advocate for how autism researchers use terms autism so currently it's defined as autism spectrum disorder because um, symptoms and phenotypes but people are trying to move away from the word disorder and maybe use the word like difference but anyway I, i'm straying at the developmental origin and so we're looking at what is it that goes different during development that can result in behaviors and i look at the microbiome so it can it be an environmental factor or is it a genetic factor? So a lot of my research and a lot of neuropsychiatry is both genetic and environmental factors and autism is one of them. And so Mount Sinai, the SIVA Autism Center that I was working for, they really did a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to or finding out the gene, genetic aspects mm -hmm. of autism. And the Shank3 gene was one of these genes that's associated with autism. And so I took the Shank3 mouse model that we generated where we mutated the Shank3 mm -hmm. gene and study it. And I then applied environmental insults to that. So now I can look at gene by environment interactions that contribute to, to autism. But yeah, you might have to ask me like a more specific question about autism and I'll answer. Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, I mean, besides that, I, I actually really wanted to touch on resveratrol that I know is also in correlation to this study. If you could talk more about that specifically. I mean, I think mostly people that I know, they hear resveratrol from their skincare with, with, with grapes, <laughs> right? Yeah, so that it's very interesting that you bring that up because that's actually um, that was more related to my addiction line. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's been one or two papers out there, not very high impact or anything. But there is some evidence to suggest that maybe treatment with polyphenols is something that can a dietary mm -hmm. that you can take with specific forms or symptoms of um, autism. But I was studying the two completely mm -hmm. independently, them and the micro microbiome and how the microbiome could alter social behavior yeah. which is what uh, defining symptoms of autism the resveratrol story comes from a researcher called Giulio Passanetti at Mount Sinai and he has been studying polyphenols for a long time uh, polyphenols are the bioactive molecules or found in grapes um, and resveratrol I believe is also a polyphenol mm -hmm. 
And so what Julio did was he tested this mixture of polyphenols that they found to be bioactive or brain penetrant, like they mm-hmm. entered the, the, and it was literally things like grapeseed extract that mm-hmm. you can buy carrots, grapeseed extract, resveratrol, and Concord grape juice mm-hmm. uh, with the sugar content in that. <laughs> yeah. in it. But it was this mixture that you can buy from everyday shops that he basically has published over 15 papers on to show that it increases resilience against stress, mm-hmm. right? When people say, you know, scientists don't look into natural compounds and their benefits, that's not true, we do. And so polyphenols have been shown to certain metabolites, break down products mm-hmm. from resveratrol polyphenols, enter the brain and can act on circuits and neurons involved in places that mediate stress and anxiety. So what I did was I took the polyphenol mixture that's already been tested against like memory and function, improving resilience. I took that same mixture and I tested it against opioid addiction-like behavior in mice. We did find some really interesting effects that polyphenols can kind of reduce addiction-like behavior to a low um, of morphine. So more evidence suggests that there is benefits to uh, polyphenols and resveratrol. In this world of social media that places so much physical critique and pressure on maintaining a youthful appearance against all environmental odds, the skincare and beauty industries have succumbed to a myriad of anti-aging practices. However, the covert fact is that beauty is timeless and that aging is a privilege. Regents, an inclusive wellness brand, seeks to promote this ritual of well-aging, understanding that it is connectivity with the body and attentive care given to it as it changes, including our skin. Founded by Filipino-American Giulio Rizio, Regents introduces the all-encompassing serum, created to target the concerns of maturing melanated skin by utilizing a blend of healing botanicals used by our ancestors and select clinically proven active ingredients. From the brightening Ayurvedic licorice root to the soothing Centella Asiatica and hydrating green algae, welcome to the journey of fueling skin health and enhancing, not changing, your natural shade. With the code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, you can get 15% off your first order on regionswellness.com. Experience the power of mixing native wisdom with modern day science. Do you have any guilty pleasures? I have one. Boba. Given that the average cafe-made milk tea has over 100 calories per serving, over 20 grams of high glycemic sugar, and is packed with artificial flavors, I am so glad that the guilty days are over with Twirl, the world's first canned plant-based milk tea. With only 45 to 50 calories per serving and containing 6 to 7 grams of low glycemic sweeteners, Twirl is made with pea milk, the most sustainable plant-based milk on the market, regenerating the soil where it comes from. Fair trade and organic are the names of the game, as the teas are sourced from biodiverse family farms in China, Japan, and Taiwan that practice sustainable farming techniques. No artificial flavors are ever used. From four different flavors to -to ready-to-eat plant-based konjac and boba pearls, let's enjoy tasty, creamy, shelf-stable, and healthy milk tea together for 10% off using the code FRANZ10, that's F-R-A-N-Z-1-0, on twirlmilktea.com. Troll around in its goodness. Growing up, I was ashamed of my Asian heritage. Classmates would comment about the lunch my grandma cooked. Other kids would make fun of my eyes. And even some adults today would tell me to go back to where I came from. But where do I really belong? Who really am I? Am I not American enough? Highlighting the year of the first documented arrival of Asian Americans in North America, 1587 Sneakers seeks to shine the spotlight on Asian American stories and demonstrate to the world the extraordinary breadth of our passions and achievements. Made with full grain natural Italian leather by Fowey Artisans, 100% biodegradable natural rubber outsole, calf leather interior lining for comfort and good smells, and waxed cotton laces for longer lasting cleanliness, these premium sneakers combine the highest quality, an array of timeless designs, and the movement to be authentically who you are. With the code FRANZ15, that's lowercase f-r-a-n-z-1-5, you can get 15% off your first order on 1587sneakers.com. Step into embracing your identity without hiding. Express yourself unapologetically.
one thing that you just said was just so interesting to me was improving resilience, right? And and I think something that um, you've mentioned a lot so far is about uh, stress and anxiety, and definitely something that you deal with is like neuropsychiatry, right? And it makes me seem like the fields of psychiatry and psychology are like cousins with neuroscience. So obviously, they're all connected with the brain, all of that, but they seem to be three very different disciplines. But based on your experience in neuroscience, what have you seen about anxiety and depression when it comes to whether the risk factors or anything that you can say about them when, in regards to, I guess, the biological mechanism of like neuroscience in itself outside of obviously the psych aspect of it? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot to unpack yeah. there. But yeah, in psychiatry, we are technically different just as neuroscience is different to uh, psychiatry. So I can only speak from the lens of neuroscience yeah. and, and not so much psychology. Yeah. In terms of you know anxiety, depression, again, all of these conditions have both genetic and environmental yeah. factors. In terms of in the brain, there are de- definitely specific circuits and regions that you see to be more hyperactive yeah. in uh, anxiety. Um, and the whole point, you know, Mount Sinai is really big on resilience research. How do you increase people's resilience against stress? And so mice, at least, how we do that is we chronically stress the mice over time. um, And then you study different interventions, things like environmental enrichment. So if a mouse is being stressed daily, but after the stress, you're returning him to a a cage that has a rug wheel and some bedding and some pups, you know, colleagues to play with, is he now more? or resilient to the depression that comes from chronic stress. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of research that's done. And also, once you've identified that a mouse is anxious and you've identified the circuit in the brain or the neurons that's associated with that, then you can try and look at what dampens that um, as it or what calms it down. But again, a lot of these conditions do have some sort of origin from either early life factors mm-hmm. that happen during childhood and development. You can inherit anxiety again there's genetic components i think some of the most interesting things that i've seen in terms of anxiety recently especially as it pertains to communities of color or communities that have gone through traumatic history is that anxiety and and fear can be passed down through generations right. through called epigenetics and again this is a very word that you've probably heard buzzing yeah. around research of people like bianca marlin at columbia yeah. university is showing that this is really a thing that happens. And so just to arm you with a bit of knowledge as to how that happens, like how you can pass on anxiety from one generation to the next, your DNA is obviously wrapped around these, you know, chromatin, but when your body needs to access the DNA to like, uh, you know, make a new protein, that chromatin has to kind of open up to allow access to the DNA. And so what epigenetics is, is changes not to the DNA itself, but to the chromatin structure. Mm -hmm. And so what can happen is if you're constantly anxious and your body's constantly making cortisol, it might happen that over time the epigenetics is such that the gene for cortisol is easily accessible and open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pass that onto your kids. They're now producing cortisol at a higher rate just because epigenetically um, it was modified. So it's very interesting, anxiety and you know, they're increasing worldwide, you know, things like loneliness are also increasing, which we think is a contributing factor to anxiety and depression. Um, mm-hmm. It's much research um, as to how we can improve it or address it, really. Yeah, I mean, all of this are just, you know, just very hard hitting facts and topics, right? I mean, we talk a lot about the gut microbiome and the influences of everything you know, when it comes to the brains and the nerves, uh, what do you think is the best part or the most rewarding part about neuroscience for you? Honestly, for me, it's being able to explain or justify feeling certain things or behaving in certain ways. And, you know, so calling myself a behavioral neuroscientist can sometimes be a, a double-edged sword in that you're able to see things through a certain lens and perspective. And I can convey that now through scientific terminology and explanation so that's what i like that's the most rewarding aspect of for me of neuroscience is being able to provide the biological explanation and terminology for everyday feelings and emotions and and behaviors and the soothing aspect of that is once people understand something or once you understand why you're feeling and behaving a certain way it's the first step to curing that issue or that behavior or feeling yeah well that's 
that was beautiful. I, I'm literally speaking to that. Yeah, I mean, you know, but despite all of that, the ability to put into words, like we said earlier, there's still so much more to learn, so much more to discover, and things that the mind cannot fathom. It's, it's, it's very so interesting that we're trying to study the mind, but even our own minds cannot wrap against all of those things, right? It's something that the the mind is actually something completely different to the brain mm-hmm. and neuroscience and these hard facts of you know this synapse bias and the calcium is real. all of that is very, very different to what is the mind right and uh, that's really now you're getting into cognitive neuroscience and those are the ones i look at and i'm like yeah i wouldn't <laughs> want to do what you're doing um so yeah the, the Cognitive neuroscience and the mind aspect of stuff, but yeah, there's there's a it's a very new field, neuroscience. Still a lot to find out. You know, recently we're finding out the importance of the immune system uh, in the brain, and you know, we thought the brain was predominantly all neurons, and you know, neurons are really what carry out the action. But we actually have more immune cells called microglia and astrocytes in the brain that kind of act like a support group to neurons neurons, and they provide like heal the neuron and look after it. And so now that the whole, like I said, the neuroimmunology field is starting to bloom and it's like whoa all right (laughs) another thing and another one and you know like we said earlier right how can one not be neurotic after trying to grasp the field of uh, neuroscience right and i think this leads us to the question of how do you separate yourself from all of these tangles and no pun intended tangles and tangles of information and expertise i mean Aside from the fact that you're an international fashion model, which I want to know how this happens and how's that li- like Hannah Montana life between between a scientist and being a model, but also in general, just like how do you separate yourself from this intricate and complex world? First of all, I want to say I've been seeing some of your modeling work as well <laughs> and balance both fields as well. So thank you. Um, but honestly. I think when people ask me that question, I'm like, duh, of course I need another outlet or something to like help balance. I think most of my colleagues have some sort, whether they play the guitar or, uh, you know, they're big nature people, they're out hiking, but you have to have a way of switching off. I think the best word I've heard that explains it is when people say, I don't have the bandwidth. There's days where I'm like, "I, I have two brain cells that are functioning right now. And so I'm very strict with myself when it comes to it, just because I know what I can produce after I've switched off. And so it's, I do it in, with the greater good of producing better work in the, in, in the coming days. And so, you know, and we all know research is very tough, you know, not only is it hard to understand conceptually, but when, when you're in the lab and yeah. trying to have these experiments, that in itself is also a mm-hmm. uh, thing. So you have to be kind to yourself. You have to find ways to relax. And, you know, whether that's me and you doing it through front of the camera or or other ways, it's definitely, uh, you know, when I speak to trainees and young people coming up in the field, they have to have protection mechanisms or relaxation mechanisms. So my modeling actually started way before my science, not way before, but like, you know, maybe three. Mm-hmm. But I think I always knew I didn't want to just do modeling because f- first of all, looks mm-hmm. fade. And second, if you kind of have that platform, deliver something more than just an image, right? I like the image is really nice, like yeah. article. Um, but sometimes a bit of a deeper message can go a long way. And so I think combining the two makes my science reach a bit further um, and reach communities it wouldn't otherwise reach. Yeah, I mean, so beautiful. I mean, an expertise of, of so many fields, honestly. And wow, Dr. I, it's just such an honor to have you on tonight. I feel like you're so contagious. Like, like all of your knowledge is going, my brain is like ready to explode right now. I, I literally have to probably sit down for 30 minutes after our live and think about everything <laughs> that you just said. And, you know, now we're connected. But yeah, like anything you're interested in reading about, you want me to send you a review on maybe like anxiety and depression. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, Dr. Osman, thank you so much. I'm so happy this finally happened. Such an honor. And thank you so much again for coming on. Have a really great evening. and enjoy- Thank you. Bye. <laughs>